Hello, welcome to Middle East Conversations Live. I'm Osman Butt. My guest today is Geoffrey Hughes. Geoffrey is a lecturer in anthropology at the University of Exeter. His work is broadly concerned with topics of kinship, emotions, Islamic ethics, and politics of everyday life in, contemporary, in the contemporary Middle East. His first book, Affections and Mercy, explores the politics of marriage in Jordan. More recently, he has written about social conflict, envy, and the impact of social media on the revival of tribal identities. His work seeks to bring, the Western, uh, bring to the Western social sciences and anthropology in particular into closer conversation with Arabic and Islamic intellectual traditions. Jeffrey, welcome to Middle East Monitor Live. Thank you for having me. So could you tell us what drew you to want to study in Jordan, right? You're studying Jordanian society more broadly, Middle East generally as well. And specifically, you've chosen to focus on kingship networks. So why, what, what drew you to all of this in the first place? Uh, yeah, so um, I was, I think, very influenced, uh, first of all, I think, by uh, the war on terror, and I was um, uh, active in the anti-war movement, but I wanted to learn more about the region, so I started studying Arabic. Uh, the reason why I ended up working in Jordan and on the particular topics that I, I work with uh, has to do with uh, the fact that I was a Peace Corps volunteer uh, in a small village in the south of Jordan for about two years. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Peace Corps, uh, it's one of these uh, sort of artifacts of mid 20th century uh, American can do spirit, right? This idea that, you know, young people with a bachelor's degree could sort of be placed in, you know, a small community uh, in the global south and through nothing but uh, sort of uh, can do attitude and optimistic spirit that they could somehow, you know, transform uh, the world around them. Now, uh, I don't think that I uh, lived up to this ideal in any way, uh, but it did become, I think, uh, a really really uh, good learning experience for me. I very much fell in love with uh, the people of Jordan, uh, the culture, the language. Uh, and uh, it also, I think, changed a lot of the ways that I thought about uh, uh, sort of social theory and uh, the sort of anthropology more generally as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think as a, as a sort of a Westerner, as, as someone who had uh, grown up in a Western society, you know, sort of I showed up uh, and I was very surprised at first that the thing that everybody wanted to talk to me about uh, was uh, the fact that I wasn't married. Uh, and in fact, uh, the fact that I wasn't married to them uh, made me a sort of object of model and pity almost, you know, that they sort of, they would commiserate with me about, you know, sort of the travails of the life of the bachelor. Uh, and they would, you know, sort of uh, try to talk to me about what I could do to fix my situation and improve my lot in life. Uh, and at first I was, you know, kind of baffled by that. I'd like to think that I sort of started studying marriage out of some great insight of my own. Uh, but honestly, I was really dragged kicking and screaming into the topic because I slowly realized uh, that the reason why people were, were talking to me about this was because this was what was uh, really important to understanding the society. And that rather than try to bring my own intellectual agenda uh, to the table, I needed to really try to understand my interlocutors in their own terms. Uh, and most importantly, that to do that, I was going to have to uh, sort of adopt uh, their own sort of uh, analytical lenses, right? Um, and one of the big things that people kept talking to me about, of course, uh, was the difficulty of getting married uh, and a so-called crisis of marriage. Uh, the crisis of marriage, I think, is uh, something that has many guises and there's many ways in which uh, people have thought about it and debated it. Uh, I think the Islamic movement in particular uh, has, uh, you know, sort of done a lot to kind of bring this to wider attention. Uh, and this is something that I would uh, sort of later uh, go on to study in some detail through uh, sort of prolonged fieldwork with uh, the uh, Jordanian Sharia courts, uh, as well as a, a Muslim Brotherhood charity called the Chastity Society, uh, which is most famous for its uh, mass weddings, I think, but also does training courses and they provide financial support. Uh, and even at one point, they actually had uh, a sort of a matchmaking service, uh, which is, of course, run exclusively by women. Uh, and uh, so that was one aspect of the crisis. But another aspect of the crisis that I heard very much from uh, a lot of my more working class friends uh, was the, that this was also a housing crisis, uh, because marriage in Jordan is a very housed relationship. Uh, and for a lot of young people uh, in Jordan, and of course, Jordan being a very uh, poor country, and this, of course, goes for most of the Middle East, um, people will continue to live with their families until they get married, right? So uh, the act of getting married really represents this, this really important leap from childhood to adulthood. So to use a sort of a classic anthropological concept, we would think about this as a, a rite of passage. Uh, and I think whereas uh, the almost, you know, kind of 
long and drawn out, you know, sort of march to adulthood that a lot of Westerners uh, experience um, is in some ways very much, uh, you know, in, in for many people in the Middle East hinges on uh, this institution of marriage, right? You're, you're sort of a child in a lot of ways, even, uh, you know, into your 20s oftentimes, you know, um, in fact, you know, if, if you're 40 years old and uh, not married, you might be called a sheb or a bent, you know, you might be called a girl or a, a youth, a young, a young puck, if you will, uh, just because you're not married. But the second you get married, you sort of, you transition into being uh, an adult, uh, then, you know, often shortly thereafter, you have your first child, and then you even get, you know, a new name, you know, you're, you're then become Abu Fulan or Um Fulan, right? Uh, and so in all of these ways, I started to think about just how important marriage was to people around me, uh, and how it regulated and structured so much of the rest of society, you know, basically, my, my everyday life uh, for the two years that I was a Peace Corps volunteer was very much centered around, well, weddings and funerals and engagement parties and uh, things like that. Uh, and so these uh, were, you know, sort of the, the background of everyday life in many ways, the sort of things that I talked about oftentimes, you know, we would talk about ma matchmaking, of course, uh, but also the cost of cement, you know, the cost of steel. And often these, these conversations blurred together because people were so, you know, sort of deeply concerned with building their houses, which would then allow them to become more desirable marriage partners. Uh, and if they could, you know, sort of manage to build their house and sort of establish themselves in the community, uh, then they could get married and then they could take on uh, the role of a sort of being a sort of a full person in the community uh, with their own sort of independent and autonomous sphere. So for all of these reasons, uh, when I got back from my two years and I uh, decided I wanted to, you know, basically leave the development sector and pursue further studies and, and, and devote my life to uh, studying uh, uh, social sciences and uh, the Middle East, uh, there was no question about what my uh, first project was going to have to be, uh, because basically my uh, interlocutors had already very helpfully su uh, supplied me with a lot of the uh, uh, analysis and material that I needed to understand uh, what was very important to them. And I think also this allowed me uh, to break out of a lot of the uh, more stale and uh, problematic and, you know, sort of um, uh, trivial aspects of commentary on the Middle East. The, the topic of marriage, I think, uh, shows us a very different view of the region, right? And I think oftentimes we tend to see uh, the Middle East as a region of conflict, a, a region of violence, um, and that's very much also, I think, very much a part of my book and very much part of my research, uh, the ways in which marriage mediates citizenship, the ways in which you can't oftentimes pass on your citizenship unless it's via, uh, you know, sort of the institution of wedlock. Um, all of this, I think, uh, was, um, you know, sort of very uh, latent in my study. Um, but I also wanted to show the, the less remarked upon, the less glamorous work of rebuilding and, and reproduction, social reproduction and care, uh, that also is very an important part of the Middle East and often gets short shrift. Uh, so this uh, shifts the focus away from sort of war and politics and big, powerful men uh, towards younger people, towards women, towards the poor, uh, and towards people who oftentimes don't uh, really get uh, proper attention uh, in the literature and also, of course, in, in broader uh, social commentary on the region. Yes, which uh, it's kind of it's funny, as you were saying, that I was thinking there's a saying that in Syria, and I'm sure it's in Jordan too, uh, which is that uh, every man is a child until he has a child. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They say that your children raise you, uh, which I think is very uh, a, a very good good uh, sort of uh, very very good analysis. But it, it also comes to our second question, which is um, the fact that you've written a book uh, about the so-called marriage crisis in Jordan, uh, and you've obviously already given us a little bit about it. But I wonder if you can expand further, and because uh, one thing you do mention as well is that you obviously have traditional ideas of marriage that are now pushing up against newer ideas of romantic love. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could just tell us a bit more about this and what is this crisis? Yeah, so I think that one aspect of the crisis is financial, it's very material, it very much has to do with uh, the long-term effects of economic austerity and war uh, and uh, 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 the refugee crisis. Uh, but another aspect of it is, I think, social, and it has to do with uh, new desires, new relationships. So I think very briefly, uh, we can talk about, uh, in, in very crude terms, right, about a, a sort of a traditional ideal of marriage that I would very much associate uh, with uh, tribal loyalties, uh, with loyalties to family and, and local place, uh, with networks of powerful patriarchs uh, who oftentimes exercise a good deal of control uh, over the reproductive choices of their kinsmen, uh, obviously as well, though, with uh, women playing a big role in matchmaking as well. Um, 
But uh, increasingly, uh, what we see is a new uh, ideal of marriage, which emphasizes romantic love. And this is pushed, I think, uh, obviously by uh, the media, uh, by uh, sort of global dreamscapes, uh, new desires coming in from the outside. Um, but of course, I think another uh, big player in this is the Islamic movement. Um, and I think this is one of the sort of less remarked upon uh, dynamics of the Islamic revival uh, is the role that uh, Islamic activists have played in normalizing and in fact validating uh, new ideals of romantic love. So I took the title of my book uh, from a, a verse of the Quran, uh, Affection and Mercy, meaning Mawada wa Rahma. Uh, there's a verse that says, you know, we created you male and female and we placed between you affection and mercy. Uh, and this uh, was a phrase that I heard a lot. Uh, it was actually, they, they uh, added it to the top of the marriage contracts in Jordan uh, in, uh, uh, at some point. Uh, and uh, when, I, when I sort of decided I wanted to, to name my project this, people sort of immediately grab, grabbed onto it and they thought this was a great title, which was of course to me a good sign that I was onto something. Uh, and um, to me, what this ideal of marriage uh, emphasized was, was more this ideal of sort of companionate marriage, right? That it's not that two families are getting married necessarily, but that two individuals are getting married, right? And this was reflected both in the Sharia courts in the way that they emphasize individual consent in a way that uh, traditional uh, marriage rights involving big tribal delegations would never do. Um, but also, of course, in the, the activism of uh, uh, sort of the chastity society, which emphasized very much uh, the need for uh, couples to have a romantic bond with each other uh, to the point of actually, uh, for instance, having uh, couples uh, write down uh, lists of work, like what they called sweet words that you could say to one another, and then uh, having the men read them out uh, to the audience as the, the young women would giggle in the background. Um, so these sort of uh, new, new ideals of marriage, I think, come into conflict, of course, right? Because in many ways, uh, you know, it is, again, you know, sort of a very poor society. People are very dependent on their families for the money it takes to establish themselves in the world. Uh, but of course, in other ways, uh, this ideal of romantic love, I think, is very appealing, right? Obviously, I think it has deep roots uh, in, uh, you know, sort of the Sufi tradition and the love poetry of uh, pr both pre-Islamic Arabia uh, and uh, uh, sort of medieval sh uh, sort of chivalric or Udri poetry as well. Uh, but there's something that becomes democratized about it, I think, in the modern era, uh, both as, uh, you know, people uh, gain more access to uh, media that, that sort of glorifies this ideal. Uh, and also, of course, as new institutions emerge that allow people to act on these desires, right? I, I remember, again, being in one of these training courses for newlyweds. Uh, and uh, the, the sort of the man who was leading it talking about how great it was that everybody had Facebook now. He said, you know, people ruin their daughters by sort of preventing them from finding love. But nowadays, everybody can sort of go out and, and meet online in a sort of a chaste uh, and, and appropriately respectful setting. Uh, and then, of course, once they've sort of formed the proper, you know, sort of interpersonal bond with each other, they can sort of go to the, with their parents and sort of have a properly legitimated marriage, which of course sort of allows them to have children within the, uh, the bounds of the institution of wedlock, uh, you know, thereby sort of preserving uh, what, what is at least in Islamic ethics, some sort of important uh, boundaries and relationships. I'm also wondering as I'm listening to this, because obviously I think the idea that uh, Islamists movements are involved in promoting romantic love is just <laughs> considered out there for a lot of Western academics who study Islamism. But I'm wondering as well whether there's another element to it, which is that if you think about traditional marriage, it's done through creating and reinforcing tribal norms. And I'm wondering whether for these particular Islamist movements, they sort of see romantic love as being a part of the effort to detribalize. Yeah, I, I definitely think, especially in uh, a, a society like Jordan, where uh, the, the tribal identity is very much used as a buttress against Islamist politics in particular, uh, that romantic love can appeal not only as an intrinsic value that I think is deeply appealing to many uh, devout Muslims, uh, but also as a sort of a solvent of uh, institutions they view as unjust, uh, backwards, and oppressive, right? Uh, so by appealing to young people, to women, to the poor, uh, to basically throw off the bonds of these relationships, uh, they can gain uh, sort of new constituents, right? Sort of people who otherwise uh, might not have a lot invested in Islamic politics, you know, when, when you're helping people get married, uh, when you're critiquing, uh, you know, sort of the forces of the older generation, and, and in particular, how they seek to control um, basically the reproductive powers of the younger generation, uh, that this is a very powerful tool for remaking society in a lot of ways. Yes, yes. And um, so moving on from this, 
um, because you've done also a lot of uh, research uh, in to do with things like social media and what impact that's having. So while many of us will remember the role social media played in 2011 uh, during the Arab Spring, um, you know, obviously often it was referred to as the Facebook revolution in Egypt and places like this. Uh, and, you know, technology has influenced societies in a number of different ways. Beyond that, though, we don't really talk beyond the obvious politics of organizing activism. But in some of your research, you're looking at the ways in which things like Facebook are mediating tribal society. So from blood feuds to managing large scale populations, social media is transforming Jordan in other ways. So could you talk to us about the ways technology is interacting and transforming Jordanian society? Yeah, so so I actually conducted research during uh, the Arab Spring. So I was basically doing my main dissertation field work. I did some preliminary work in 2010. And then uh, from 2011 to 2012, uh, I was doing my research. Um, now, in Jordan, I think the Arab Spring actually in some ways started a bit earlier than January 25th, right? There was uh, a lot of uh, already uh, sort of uh, uh, ferment uh, and revolutionary sort of activity uh, unfolding in Jordan in 2010. Um, but what I experienced primarily during the Arab Spring uh, was obviously there was uh, sort of more explicitly and overtly political uh, sort of organizing uh, happening around social media, enabled by social media. But there was another phenomenon that was much more sort of immediate in my everyday life living in rural Jordan. Uh, and that was a, a sort of an explosion of uh, basically blood feuds. Uh, so these were conflicts uh, that would often start uh, with uh, some sort of point of honor, some sort of injury, maybe a, a case of sexual harassment or a murder. Uh, and they had this tendency to sort of spiral out of control, uh, leading to violence. There were basically about, I think, five times when I got caught up in, in these these clashes. Um, and I was not seeking this out in any way. This was just sort of happening around me. And I would, would sort of happen a, a, a across these sort of uh, clashes. Uh, and they were organized on social media. Uh, they involved young people who oftentimes would sort of um, basically use uh, tools like Facebook and later WhatsApp uh, to uh, basically decide on sort of when to meet up and they would fight it out in the streets. And oftentimes when the, the gendarmerie showed up, they would turn on the gendarmerie as well, uh, drawing them into the fight. And this also, of course, over time led to uh, an increase in the phenomenon of banishment or what's known in, in Jordanian Arabic as jalwa, right? This, uh, there was a sort of a, a big uptick uh, during this time period uh, in the number of extended families that were banished from the governorates where they lived by the local governor uh, for reasons of public order. Uh, so, uh, you know, obviously on some level, I think that this was organic, right? That this was people using a new technology. Uh, but in other ways, I think we can see uh, I think between the organic and possible manipulation by more powerful and, and sort of malevolent actors, uh, how uh, the technology of social media itself, I think, lends itself uh, to these sort of subnational identities, right? So if we if we think about the classic literature on uh, you know sort of media and nationalism, for instance, there's something I think um, you know think about Benedict Anderson's Imagine Communities, of course, and his uh, arguments about the print trade, you know Jurgen Habermas's public sphere. Uh, there's something about uh, sort of the trade in print and then later on television, of course, uh, which lends itself to these sort of large national publics, right? You want to standardize language in many ways uh, and you uh, want to get the lot largest audience possible. Uh, but in, in contrast, social media, I think, oftentimes works by uh, competing with existing forms of media by basically micro-targeting and, and, and creating new ways of segmenting publics. Uh, in, in various ways. And, and tribal identity becomes uh, a very powerful way of segmenting uh, existing identities and sort of drawing on and working with uh, this pre-existing material uh, to sort of make new uh, possibilities apparent, right? Uh, so uh, when you think about, you know, say a, a sort of, a, a, you know, something like Facebook already, right? You know, you, you sort of oftentimes, you know, you look at who someone's friends with are on Facebook, well, who are people's friends? Oftentimes it's family members, right? Uh, you know, it's even to the point where, um, you know, in Jordan, of course, already because of the tribal identities and this predated uh, social media, of course, uh, I, I heard people talk about how different tribes were associated with different cell phone plans because you would get, you know, sort of a discount for within network calls. And so you would have all this pressure from your kinsmen to sort of switch to one of the cell phone companies so that people could talk to you for cheaper, right? So there's already ways in which, you know, sort of prior to the existence of social media, we were seeing how uh, different sorts of publics were being made possible by uh, new forms of, of commercial communication. 
Uh, but I think social media really sort of amped up the, the, the possibilities here. And, and one of the things in particular that, that became possible uh, was to organize people uh, within these sort of subnational identity categories and to organize them around particular forms of controversy. And I think especially because social media is a more uh, agonistic media that oftentimes draws on conflict uh, and um, really feeds off of uh, especially local events and, and the need to keep up with local events, uh, that these sort of, of blood feuds became sort of the perfect way to sort of draw people uh, into these, these sort of new publics and uh, also to sort of reorient people's uh, political awareness in, in very powerful ways. Um, so for instance, uh, to give an example though, of where this becomes more politicized, where I think this kind of escapes the control uh, of, uh, you know, sort of the, the public security apparatus, uh, I would have to say, I think probably the best example uh, came much later uh, when um, uh, there was a member of the Hoi Tat tribe who uh, was involved in what I think the U.S. military refers to as a green on blue incident at a, at a military base in southern Jordan. Uh, he uh, was from the Tawaya section of the Hoi Tat tribe. Uh, that's for those of you who are familiar with Lawrence of Arabia, uh, Oida Abutaya, whose uh, eponymous ancestor was uh, kind of the sort of the major figure in, in sort of the uh, Great Arab Revolt of uh, 1917. Uh, and about 100 years later, you have this incident of this uh, lone Jordanian soldier um, killing uh, four U.S. servicemen in front of a military base and claiming that he was doing it to defend the military base. Uh, and uh, this became a, a cause celebre online. The, 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 the Facebook page for the, the tribe of the Hoi Tat uh, at one point had over 90,000 members. Uh, and they began organizing demonstrations to support him, arguing that he was being framed for this. This was part of a, a dark conspiracy by uh, the American government, you know, and, and we can put aside, I guess, all of the sort of the, the intrigue and, and the particular uh, sort of details of the case. Uh, but I think it shows how, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the institution of, of, uh, of, tri of, of the tribes and, and these new social media uh, became an imaginative space in which people could imagine uh, other uh, alternative futures and also in a way rewrite their own past. And I think that the fact that he uh, was, uh, you know, sort of from the Tuwaya section in particular, uh, the way in which he was in some ways kind of refuting uh, that initial alliance and allowing people who had become more uh, ambivalent about this uh, long-term alliance with the West to kind of rethink this relationship uh, in new ways uh, kind of exemplifies how these new technologies um, pr provide both, I think, sort of political opportunities, uh, but also, of course, uh, real limitations, right? After all, um, you know, sort of the this uh, movement couldn't ever really, I think, generate uh, a sort of a leader figure. I mean, the, the sort of the person they were sort of defending was obviously sort of packed off to jail and uh, never really heard from again, as far as I can tell. Uh, and if anything, really, you know, it, it could only be Abu Taya himself from beyond the grave who could really represent uh, this sort of particular constellation of forces, right? So it was, a, in some ways, I think, a sort of an abortive attempt, obviously, to sort of create a, an alternative political reality. Um, and may also, I think, point to the limitations of social media, right? Uh, and the ways in which these don't have the, the liberatory potential that people often say they do. Um, but I think suffice it to say that it, we, we ignore these uh, developments at our peril. Yes, and um, tribalism is something that does play because a big prominent role in Jordanian society. Uh, but how does this influence in the in, how does it influence the country first of all? And more importantly, though, how does it interact with non-tribal aspects of society? Right, because not all of Ch Jordan is tribal, but you do have urban centers of people who are not, you know, live urban lives like everywhere else. So I'm wondering what the day-to-day -day interactions between those two are like. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I think it's important to emphasize, yes, that, that, that Jordan is very much um, split between people who, uh, you know, really buy into these tribal identities and, and feel these, these uh, connections very deeply. Some of them, of course, are themselves urban, right? So there are actually tribal neighborhoods in uh, many Jordanian cities like Hai Tafaila and Arman, uh, but also in, in sort of the more regional cities. Uh, and I, I, as well, of course, as people who are very anti-tribal in rural areas, either because they espouse liberal values or because they're more connected to the Islamic movement. Uh, but, um, you know, sort of there is, I think, in general, yes, this, there's a kind of a split between urban and rural, with rural areas being much more uh, you know, sort of amenable to these uh, tribal values, people in urban areas, I think, being uh, sort of a lot more suspicious. Um, and yeah, so for, I think people in the cities, oftentimes, uh, this all seems very backwards. It's kind of embarrassing. Uh, I was once giving a talk on, on sort of social media and tribalism. And, and one of the questions was a sort of a distinguished gentleman got up and he asked me sort of, why are you making us look retarded? 
in the question and answer session. I think what he meant was something like, you know, why are you making a scene backwards? Um, and my answer was that, you know, I don't necessarily see tribalism as backwards. So I respect the opinion. I think that, you know, sort of a lot of people, uh, you know, within Jordanian society uh, have every right to see this as backwards, right? I think that there's a lot of aspects of, of uh, these uh, sort of tribal uh, disputes that are, I think, very uh, concerning, right? I mean, the act of, of sort of banishing entire families is obviously a clear violation of norms of individual rights. Uh, you lose your right to uh, employment, your right to schooling, your, even your right to vote, right? Um, and if you're just attacked because you happen to have the last name, I mean, you know, what did you do to deserve that, right? Um, now, of course, people uh, in the rural areas oftentimes uh, tend to sing the praises of tribalism. They see this as the, the real source of, of law and order in Jordan. They say it's not the police uh, that keep the peace here. It's actually the tribes that people are afraid of the tribes. And that's why there's, there's law and order here. Um, now, I think another aspect of this, of course, is the role of the government in uh, sort of promoting these identities, right? I think sometimes people tend to sort of attribute all of the agency either to, uh, you know, sort of something like culture or sort of, you know, you know, sort of national identity, or they attribute it all to the state. I would argue it's it's a very much a sort of an interplay between the two, right? Um, in some ways, the, the the state has done a lot to uh, dissuade people from pursuing these these. Um, um, practices. They do obviously intervene very forcefully when people uh, start uh, engaging in blood feuds in, in particular ways. Uh, but of course, in other ways, they very much support this. Uh, so uh, there's actually three crimes in Jordan that the government basically will uh, allow uh, for a, a tribal settlement to, at least to a certain degree. Those are the crimes of uh, blood, honor, and cutting of the face, which basically means murder, um, various forms of sexual assault, uh, and uh, the breaking of tribal truces. Uh, and especially in the case of murder, there's an idea that uh, if you uh, kill someone in Jordan, you can reach a blood money payment, uh, then you can get your sentence cut in half, right? That there's idea that half of the sentence is, is for the family and, and half of it is for the state. Uh, though, of course, uh, I've definitely seen cases where people have basically gotten away with murder, uh, so to speak, as long as they can play a blood money payment and convince the other family not to cooperate in the investigation, right? So, uh, there are definitely ways in which uh, the Jordanian government, I think, very much supports this. And I think also if you look at patronage around uh, sort of jobs and uh, various uh, sorts of, especially I think the parliament uh, being the sort of the, the, the clearest example of this, there's a lot of literature uh, about uh, how uh, uh, sort of the Jordanian parliament uh, is, is very much shaped around tribal identities, right? Um, the Islamic movement uh, came close to uh, sort of winning control of parliament in the early 1990s. Uh, and that was because they had these multi-member districts and what people would do is they would vote for a family member for the first candidate and then they would vote for members of the Islamic movement uh, down ticket. Uh, but that meant that the Islamic movement would oftentimes win uh, a lot of seats. So then they switched it very explicitly to single member districts uh, to basically prevent that, you know, to basically sort of gerrymander it such that um, uh, you would have these sort of independent candidates uh, who would get elected. And as in many parts of the world, they would then sort of compete on their ability to uh, bring back the bacon, you know, as it were, to uh, their local constituents in the form of uh, jobs and, and sort of development projects. Uh, and those would, of course, be distributed very much along uh, sort of family lines, thereby sort of reifying and, and sort of uh, uh, intensifying these relationships. Okay, um, so uh, what I would like to now move towards is the fact that obviously you work in anthropology, um, and you also do a lot of fieldwork in anthropology. Um, and it's in a very, it's often described as an extractive process, right? So you're going into a community, you're taking the data that you want or whatever the research is, um, but often the community itself doesn't necessarily benefit per se from that research, or they could, but they don't always. So how has your particular work impacted those communities that you've studied? That's a really good question again. Yeah, I, I'd say that it, it I, I can't say my work has had a lot of impact so far. Uh, I'd like to, to have more. One of the reasons why I, I, I'd like to engage in, in sort of fora like this is because I think this is a way of uh, sort of bringing my, my research to new audiences also within the region who can benefit from it. Uh, it's been very important to me, of course, to sort of share my findings with uh, the organizations I work with. So I've, I've definitely tried to take back my findings to groups like the Sharia courts. So when I did a, uh, a study of about sort of 800 and uh, 50 marriage contracts, I, I was sure to sort of bring back uh, the results of that uh, sort of statistical study to uh, the Sharia court judges and present it to them so that they would have that information. Um, 
I think that, uh, you know, sort of the highest praise that you can pay an anthropologist as uh, a person from the culture being studied is to say something like, uh, oh, I've never thought of that before, or, you know, you're really right about that, actually, I hadn't thought about it that way. And I, I'd like to think that I've been honored with that uh, sort of, uh, uh, that sort of compliment uh, on a number of occasions, at least a couple of times, I hope it was genuine. Um, now, I think that in, in other ways, though, I, I, I think that, yeah, I, you know, there is an extractive dimension, of course, uh, to uh, field work, and I think that's kind of inevitable. Uh, I think that if that was the sort of where, where it ended, that would be very bad, and, and the sort of the colonial overtones of that would be uh, ind indefensible. But um, the way that I try to deal with this in a deeper uh, way um, is certainly not by thinking that, you know, I'm going to sort of uh, tell people things that, you know, sort of they've, they've never thought of. I'm going to solve their problems. Uh, you know, once and for all, right? Like some sort of development worker or white savior or something. Uh, but I think that there is a value more in this aspect of civilizational dialogue uh, and in uh, taking anthropology in particular, not just as uh, an aspect of sort of me taking a sort of, uh, you know, sort of data from uh, the people that I work with and sort of applying a, a sort of a, a priori theoretical framework to it or sort of using it to develop a sort of a new theory of everything, uh, but actually taking seriously local theories, right? And actually uh, bringing them into dialogue uh, with anthropology on an equal footing, right? So this, I think, to, to sort of connect back to the beginning uh, is why it was very important for me to pick a topic where I thought that uh, the people that I was talking to uh, actually had something to say uh, to uh, anthropology, but also to basically sort of shift the epistemological grounds on which the research is done, right? So it's not just that I take my data from one place and I apply a theory from somewhere else, uh, but that I, I basically try to turn it more into a conversation, right? Uh, and that I try to uplift uh, sort of local uh, voices and sort of local theories, local uh, 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 sort of social theorists, uh, and also uh, basically sort of critique uh, sort of existing assumptions uh, within sort of uh, Western social theory, not just about the region per se, but also about how society works more generally. Uh, so this is why it's been very important to me to, to sort of to engage seriously with uh, Islamic ethics and uh, Islamic and, and uh, other Arabic uh, epistemological frameworks uh, is because I want to uh, basically uh, sort of challenge the idea uh, of uh, the social sciences as a fundamentally Western pursuit and show how uh, basically all humans have their own uh, anthropologies, right? And how anthropology is not just something that academics do, it's something that's part of everyday life uh, and really to try and, and sort of break down those traditional boundaries. And I think that that's something that uh, we're seeing a lot of in various ways, right? I think that um, one thing, for instance, uh, that we see a lot of uh, is how uh, traditional sort of Orientalist scholarship even, uh, which was never designed for the benefit of anyone uh, in the Middle East, uh, is oftentimes taken up and creatively reappropriated by scholars within the region, uh, oftentimes to push uh, all sorts of agendas that no one could have ever imagined when uh, these books were actually being written. So part of the revival and efflorescence of tribal identities isn't just about uh, you know, sort of people using social media to sort of uh, reinvigorate, you know, sort of primordial ties as, as Clifford Geertz would have put them, uh, but, but also the ways in which they can uh, gain access to and creatively reappropriate uh, Western discourses for their own ends, right? So um, one thing that I hope will happen over time is that people will uh, sort of find my research and use it for all sorts of purposes I never could have imagined, right? Um, uh, for better or worse, because I don't really want to sort of take that kind of ownership of my work. I very much sort of want to see myself again as part of uh, a much more authentic dialogue where uh, I approach the people I work with, not as, you know, sort of the synoptic all seeing eye from above, but very much as an equal, very much sort of in the same sort of muck of the real, if you will, uh, just trying to sort of get a little bit more purchase on things and, and, and really trying to, to sort of break down these uh, traditional epistemological uh, boundaries that we often see as uh, structuring uh, the study of the Middle East on very unequal lines. Jeffrey, thank you for talking to us at Middle East Monitor Live. Thank you for having me. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in. Please do tune in next week for another Memo Conversations.